Thank you all very much. Uh, you're very welcome. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute, and I'd like to welcome uh, you all this afternoon. Whatever you're expecting or were expecting, I'm not sure if it included walking onto a movie set, um, but you've, you've had that pleasure, um, and uh, we're surrounded by that outside, but um, I don't think it'll affect our uh, deliberations. Um, so our session this afternoon, maintaining competitiveness while advancing the net zero transition, um, is that's the agenda. Um, my role is really just to do what I've effectively already done, which is to welcome you here and tell you who I am, and uh, to introduce our uh, chair of the session. Before I do that, I'd just like to recognise the presence of Barbara Nolan, um, the representative of the EU Commission here in Dublin, and thank her for all of her support and continuing uh, cooperation with us here at the Institute, which is really invaluable to us. Um, I would just identify our two distinguished speakers, Matthew Baldwin and Jacob Werksman. I won't say too much about them because our distinguished chair will do that. And our chair is Professor Lisa Ryan, um, Professor in Energy Economics and at UCD, well known to us here at the Institute uh, as a member of our Climate and Energy Group and uh, a great supporter and participant in many of our activities. So I'm really looking forward to the session. It's my pleasure to hand the floor to Lisa Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, thank you all for coming here today. I think this is a great turnout. We haven't had so many in-person events. I think, well, I certainly haven't been attending so many in-person events, and I'm delighted to be here with distinguished speakers. And I think it speaks for the speakers that so many have come today. So. We are delighted that Matthew Baldwin and Jacob Berksman have, um, are going to speak to us today. So Matthew is the Deputy Director General at DG Ener, which is the European Commission's Energy Department, for those not familiar. And then Jacob is the Principal Advisor to the DG for Climate Action. Um, so both of these are here in town as part of the European Commission's Roadshow and are going to speak to us about um, European energy policy, but also really in the, con the low carbon transition in the context of competitiveness. Um, I'm very interested in this topic. I had signed up to come even before I was made the chair. Um, I, because I do think it's an important topic. I teach this topic um, to students and I'm uh, constantly I'm showing them the three pillars. And I think it's something that if we want to have a future low carbon um, in, in Europe, then we need to be able to convince our citizens and businesses that this is going to be not just not at the expense of competitiveness, but actually that's going to make us more competitive in the future. So I think this is a key topic for us uh, to hear what your thoughts on it and what uh, the European Commission is thinking about going forward with it. So the, I suppose the structure here is that each of you will speak for 10 minutes um, and then we will open for a Q&A. And I should say that this is going to be is recorded now, so we're all here in person. It's not a hybrid live streaming event, but the opening remarks are recorded. And then we're going to have Q&A, which will not be recorded, and that will be Chatham House rules. So I look forward to wild and um, interesting discussions when you're, since you're not going to be recorded at that. Um, okay, so we're... Very, very, very boring. And very, very, very boring. <laughs> well... Feel free, feel free. So um, let's begin, and I'm going to formally introduce Matthew first, who's going to be our first speaker. So Matthew Baldwin was appointed as Deputy Director, as I said before, in DGNR um, since 2000, uh, sorry, in 2022, um, where he is responsible for the Energy Platform Task Force. He has served in the European Commission for over 20 years, where he was previously Deputy Director General in DG Move for six years, running the Commission's Horizon Europe mission for 100 climate neutral and smart cities by 2030, and also served. Uh, and how smart are we? I wonder. Um, and, <laughs> and also served as the EU coordinator for road safety and sustainable urban mobility. He was also director for aviation in DG Move and director for market access in DG Trade. So maybe I'll invite you to speak you. now, and then I'll introduce Jacob when he's the chair. Um, even though I'm being recorded uh, now. Uh, <laughs> Therefore, I had to be very, very boring. I think, um, I think both Jake and I would very much like this to be in the spirit of a round table, even if we are not around a table, um, and, uh, and a sort of free and frank exchange of views really from the outset. That's one of the sort of cliches here in terms of the name. The other is in terms of a road show, which conveys a sort of certain sweaty glamour um, as we go around Europe at breakneck speed explaining ourselves. But this is to be slightly more prosaic, this is one of a series of um, um, 
visits, or not just Jake and I, but all the senior management across our two departments will be making. And I'll try to explain a bit what the purpose of that is. And, and I will come to competitiveness. Um, but before I do, thank you very much for your introduction to Lisa. Thank you, Alex, for, for having us over here at the back. And thank you, Barbara, for being such a great representative for us and looking after us so well today. I mean, where this all stems from to pull back, and we have got some very specific things, is the transitional nature at the moment. Of course, green transition, energy transition, but political transition this year. And it's a very important moment to take the climate, another misuse of the word, about where Europe's going, where different member states are going, and the difficult, difficult and important choices we face on the climate and energy policies. Jake's from the climate department, I'm from the energy department. We talk a lot, we work together, um, but there are some interesting and important distinctions in terms of what we do. With the European Green Deal, where we are absolutely in, at one united, we've set the path towards climate neutrality and a resilience by 2050. This means the right policy to place at the European level and at the national level. Specifically, we have a very, we believe, a very useful tool called the National Energy and Climate Plans, which are 10-year plans, um, which outline how each member state, in considerable detail, intends to meet the energy and climates for 2030, the Fit for 55 targets uh, headlined in 55% emissions reduction, of course, by, 20, by 2030. Um, we're now in uh, an, an active round of the uh, NECPs being updated. Um, we received uh, uh, updated NECPs from 26 member states, including Ireland, I'm glad to say. I, you thought I was going to say, and the 27th is Ireland, but no, you're one of them. We published our assessment of the our EU wide assessment on the draft uh, updated NECPs last year. And we've now also published uh, individual assessment and country specific recommendations for, I think, now 24 of the the plans that we've received, again, including Ireland uh, relatively recent, recently. Um, the good news is I think that member states are taking this exercise very seriously, and I think they too tend to share our view that it's a useful tool and a comparable peer-to-peer -to -peer tool that they all have uh, to, to, to measure progress and to compare plans. The slightly less good news is that the draft plans are clearly not yet sufficient to meet our EU climate targets. And, Member states now have until the 30th of June to try to incorporate um, some of the recommendations that we've made and then to submit those final plans. To give you an idea of the numbers, if you look at it in terms of the 55% uh, uh, emissions reduction uh, target, we are currently um, at about 51% by, by 2030, so that's a quite a significant shortfall. If you want to look at it in terms of... Um, in terms of um, effort sharing uh, reduction under the effort sharing regulation, we are at 34%. Um, uh, I'm looking at <laughs> Robin to check I've got these numbers right. 34% against an overall effort of 40. And Ireland uh, is also um, not quite there yet in terms of its effort sharing. It's at 42% against 48. Look at, uh, it should have been, again, speak up if I've got that wrong. That's a 42% reduction by 2030 based on the 20, uh, 2005 numbers. So rather than just send sort of bureaucratic missives out from Brussels to different parts of the EU, we thought it'd be good to come and explain and try to explain in a bit more detail where the concerns are. Of course, there's been a lot of back and forth. We've been delighted to be received today by Minister Eamon Ryan and, and colleagues from the Climate and Energy Ministry. This today for us is going to be a listening exercise for us as much as a talking exercise, I hope, to hear your views on where things um, are going. Um, and in particular, we want to deepen this dialogue with national policymakers and extend the conversation as far as possible to include all stakeholders and, and, and really interested citizens. Um, we are very conscious in, in all of this that we need to take account of different national circumstances. It would be a completely pointless exercise to try to say one size necessarily must, must fit all. Um, and in that context, how that combination of national and European policies protects people's welfare and well-being, the competitiveness of companies, um, 
uh, 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 farmers, society's socioeconomic cohesion, and every country will be different. That's why this is so important. Um, it also comes against a backdrop uh, um, in which we have set out the plans um, and we've called for a debate on a 2040 emissions reduction target. So again, we got a 55% by 2030, we have got our net zero by 2050, and in between, the Commission recommends that uh, we adopt a target for 2040, which we are, we've put at 90%. So we need to get 90% of the way to net zero by 2040. That shouldn't come as too shocking an exercise. We were discussing, Jake, earlier that if you draw a line from 2030 through to net zero by 2050, you, you're at about 88. We're recommending going a bit further, a bit faster by 2040. Um, and again, it's just a recommendation for the consideration uh, over the course of this uh, coming period. Um, um, to precisely to try to provide that investment certainty, that, uh, that clearer frame of, of action. So we put out two terrible Brussels speak um, communications with a capital C, setting out why we think we need to do this, um, why we think this is uh, crucial in terms of meeting our uh, Paris Agreement targets, keeping in goal the 1.5 um, uh, degrees Celsius uh, objective. Um, and again, providing that continuity and predictability uh, in terms of all the different, not just investment, but also policy decisions, public and private, that will need to be met. It responds very carefully to the European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change's recommendation. Um, uh, and, and I think that's a, an important consideration. We, it's not just the Commission in its ivory tower plucking out a number. It's based on very careful modeling work, and very careful consideration. Just for, quickly from um, um, a more of a, uh, an energy perspective, if I could here, um, and particularly turning in to look at what Ireland has done, and, and then Jake can speak to the more general provisions. Um, we note that the, we're looking for a very clear sense of direction, both on renewables. Um, uh, we want to see a significant uh, raising of the ambition for the 2030 share of renewables. Uh, if you look at the governance formula, which is, works under the National Energy and Climate Plans, we, 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 we're looking at a 43% share. Um, under the National Climate Plan, um, which is a separate exercise, of course, Ireland has indicated that it wants to have 80% of its electricity production coming from renewable energy by 2030. So we're looking to see that translate into a, a strong renewables number in this plan. Um, energy efficiency, of course, is a very difficult topic difficult in, in many, many parts of the world. Um, it's essential that the final NECP from Ireland really helps drive a clear framework towards, these, uh, towards this effort, including national energy efficiency contributions in both final and primary energy consumption, and a complete description of the policies and measures that would achieve this target based on the principle of the energy efficiency first uh, principle being implemented. Um, as we go forward, and I know you, to broaden out briefly, and then I'll pass the floor over to, to Jake, um, this, this discussion is now taking place very much in the context of, of competitiveness. Um, some people say, ah, this is the EU starting to wander away from the, 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 the implementing of the Green Deal as its core principle. I, I personally profoundly don't see that. I don't hear that in the in the description, in a communication we put up last week, I think President von der Leyen described the European Green Deal as our new growth strategy. But it does, we do need to keep growth and competitiveness in this equation and in this discussion, and that's why we're very happy to have this discussion framed uh, in this way. And we also, of course, need to remember, and this is my final point, I promise, the broader context. We are not just doing this inside the European Union. Uh, that wouldn't have a, a sense of purpose. Um, we are very excited that what happened in the last COP meeting, the COP28, which gave us, I think, quite a powerful momentum overall, globally, towards uh, the transition away from fossil fuels, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, for example. Um, I know that Ireland has particularly uh, taken the commitment to phase out coal and, and peat fired electricity generation. So this is a, a very positive sign and a positive contribution to what's going on at the international level. Um, 
we want to see now concrete steps towards that transition away from fossil fuels, again, orderly and a just transition in the language of the COP. Um, and we also believe that the tripling uh, of energy of, uh, of, of renewables and the doubling of energy efficiency commitments at the global level will help drive us uh, uh, positively down that line. So those are my opening remarks to kick off. That's the context in which we're, we're talking about it. Um, we are very keen to see um, Ireland continue to lead, as it does in many areas, uh, including uh, in what it's ready to put on the table in terms of its national energy and climate plan. Jake. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, allow me to introduce Jacob first before I hand it over to you finally. Um, so Jacob Worksman is um, the principal advisor, as I said, to the Director General of uh, climate, for Climate Action in the European Commission since 2012, and his work focuses on the international aspects of European climate policy. He is head of delegation for the European Union to the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework and Convention on Climate Change. Prior to joining the Commission, he provided legal and policy advice to developed and developing country governments, NGOs, and international institutions in the context of multilateral negotiations in climate change, biosafety, and trade. He is currently also a visiting professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and has lectured in international environmental and economic law at several universities. And I think I'll hand it over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. And, th and thanks, uh, Matthew, and thanks to the organizers and our, and our hosts for uh, inviting us to join us uh, today. Um, as Matthew says, uh, we're, we're here primarily to, to give in a perspective from, from Brussels on the particular stage that we are in climate and energy policy making, but also very much to, to hear from, from you on your views of both what Ireland is doing, what it can continue to do, and, and how it's reacting to EU policy uh, developed within, uh, within our context. It's hard for me even coming to an individual member state to fully remove my hat as a, as a climate change negotiator. What I do on a day-to-day on a -day basis is to engage with the rest of the international community to try to persuade them um, to be as ambitious as Europe hopes to be in tackling the challenge of climate change. That absolutely depends as our first and foremost diplomatic tool that we can demonstrate that we as the EU are taking the Paris Agreement seriously and that we are showing leadership. We only represent roughly 7% of global emissions. So our climate change policies, if they are about preventing dangerous climate change, as defined by Paris, avoiding a 1.5 degree global average temperature rise, only succeeds if we can persuade others uh, to, to, to follow uh, as well. This is a particular unique moment in time, as Matthew was pointing out, for, for Irish climate policy, for European climate policy, and for global pol climate policy. And that is because of something that we built into the Paris Agreement called the ambition cycle. Every five years, rather than negotiating a new treaty, as we did with the Kyoto Protocol and then the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement is supposed to adjust and refresh itself to bring new ambition through a process by which we look at what the science is telling us has to be done. We look at what we've been able to achieve so far in terms of implementation. And then we set a new set of targets for ourselves to make sure that we as individual parties, but the globe as a whole, is moving towards net zero. Um, and we have increasingly specific indications of what we need to get there. One is the, the transition away from fossil fuels. But, but that's the, uh, essentially the idea of the Paris Agreement ambition cycle. We as the EU uh, very consciously, and I think very conscientiously, designed that same ambition cycle into our European climate law. So as Matthew describes, we also now have to re respond every five years to the science. This isn't global science from the IPCC, but it's further distilled through the EU Climate uh, Scientific Advisory Board into EU-specific recommendations about what we can do in a cost-effective manner to get our emissions down. And then through these national energy and climate plans, we expect each of the member states also to say how they are responding. So we're at a moment where we're supposed to be demonstrating that we are implementing our existing targets. Those are the targets that take us out to 2030, the famous Fit for 55 package that the uh, NECPs are intended to address. But it's also the moment in time where we begin to reflect on what happens next in the post-2030 period, where we can demonstrate that we're putting ourselves on a pathway to net zero as is required by the European climate law and, as I understand, is also required by the Irish uh, climate law and, and policy framework as well. So we are, we are compelled by the science to do this. Um, if we don't, 
uh, we're in deep trouble. Um, we're bound by the law to do this, from the Paris Agreement uh, to the European Climate Law to the Irish Climate Law. But I don't know if you followed in the press that the European Court of Human Rights uh, just, just ruled this week um, that, in fact, human rights law holds at least European countries uh, to an obligation to protect their citizens' right to, to private life and to life by responding effectively to the challenge of climate change. Um, so all, all of this set of, of, uh, of, of legal principles and, and, and rules and guidance uh, compels us as well. The economics, as, uh, as Matthew was describing, invite us to move along this path as well. Uh, if, if what happened in Dubai um, is, is real, uh, if governments respond to what it is they themselves agreed, that we are transitioning away from fossil fuels, the economic opportunities of investing in that transition become absolutely essential for any economy that wants to thrive and to prosper, as the EU does and as Ireland does, to, to grab on uh, to, to this opportunity um, as well. So the real challenge now is, is aligning the politics, making sure that the politics maintain that momentum, and making sure that the policies generated by those politics are granular and specific enough to create that very important investment environment uh, to, to take place uh, and to ensure that, that that transition continues to have momentum. And that's where the, the NECPs for Ireland and for the different member states begin to reveal, well, how many specific steps has each member state taken to convert the law, uh, what, what, the, what the economics uh, invite us to do, what the science requires us to do, into something that is more uh, predictable, uh, stable, and investable um, by, by a combination of, of public sector and private sector investments. Um, and what we see from the um, many member states and ECPs is they're, they're beginning to take the first steps in that direction. But our, our review has indicated for Ireland and for others that, that more could be done to create that more specific policy context in which those essential investments uh, really, really need to take place. Um, so as uh, we, hopefully our conversation will we'll get to in, in a moment, we're now in this period where the Irish NECP is being updated. Uh, and we'd like to hear from you, as we've heard from the, uh, from the Irish government, what the plans are to make uh, that particular NECP a, a little bit more specific and, and uh, directional. Um, the EU, of course, is here to help with that transition. Um, we have developed many tools uh, to assist. One is the NEC process itself, uh, where colleagues like, like mine from DG Klima, um, Robin is here, a desk officer for, for Ireland who has studied not just the Irish uh, uh, NECP, but also the experiences of other member states. We can help with that kind of lesson learning so that, that member states can learn from each other's policies, particularly in those areas that aren't directly governed by European policy. Um, those emissions that are outside, for example, the EU ETS, uh, how they've, for, for, for example, been able to tackle um, energy efficiency in buildings, road transportation, uh, land use, land use change, and forestry, which aren't as directly governed uh, by EU policy uh, as, as those um, sectors of the economy that are directly covered by, by the cap and trade system. So we can help through that, um, but we've also been very careful to try to develop as much as we can financial resources that can kick off investments as well. So our response to the COVID crisis, our response to the energy crisis uh, in, caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, all provided opportunities for us to pool resources at the at the, at the EU regional level and make them available to member states to help them with the recovery and with the cost of energy. But we made sure that those investments would have to be aligned with our climate and energy goals as well. Uh, and so there are now uh, hundreds of millions of euros flowing uh, to member states, including to Ireland, to allow them to invest in things like um, uh, the, 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 and essentially the, some of the policies and investments that lie behind uh, the, uh, the NECP as it's, uh, as it's emerging. We've also managed to, through the ETS, um, to collect uh, resources at the regional level to invest in the cutting edge of, of what will be required to fully green our economy. Um, the latest of these is the Innovation Fund, uh, which we expect to be able to raise as much as 40 billion uh, euros over the course of the period between now and 2030. And we've already begun to make those resources available to investors that come forward with credible projects where they believe that with some additional money, um, they can transform energy technologies, for example, 
into commercially viable uh, projects. An example recently uh, from, from Ireland uh, was a significant investment in uh, a, a, a wave and tidal energy um, project, uh, if I'm getting this right, the Searsha uh, de development wave energy uh, in, in, uh, offshore in, in County Clare. So we can help uh, in, in those ways as well. And my understanding is that there are nine new proposals from Ireland alone that are entering the pipeline in, in 2023 for more investments uh, uh, of that nature. Um, we're also very impressed by the, uh, the framework that Ireland has put in place in terms of its climate law, but also the advice that it's getting from the Climate Change uh, Advisory Council and its Committee on Adaptation as to how it can ensure that public funds are, are flowing into the policies uh, that can make all of, all of this happen. But these examples um, really won't take root. The specific examples of project investments from resources coming from the EU won't take root uh, unless there is that, that domestic policy context um, that ensures investors that uh, there will be continuity over time that will support the use of these energies and, and these, uh, these technologies. Let me briefly touch upon the issue of agriculture because uh, we know that that is a sensitive issue uh, within Ireland, but also across the EU. Both Matthew and I have had the experience of having to walk back home through the streets of Brussels, um, smelling the burning tires and stepping in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the manure that was spread by farmers, some of them pushing back uh, against what they see as, as over-regulation uh, coming, coming from, uh, from, from Brussels. There is no doubt that this sector, the land use change and forestry sector, as we describe it in the EU, is one of the, 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 the toughest to tackle, uh, not just because of the politics, but because some of the technologies aren't yet available to help us, for example, to directly manage methane emissions from, from, from livestock. And so it is what we call one of the hardest to abate sectors. There is no question that if we're going to get to net zero by 2050, we're going to have to find a mix of policies incentives that make sure that we can get those emissions down while continuing to allow our agricultural sector, our farmers, to prosper. And we are looking at ways, and in some ways very innovative ways, of how we can do that. Um, a recent proposal uh, from the, the Commission uh, has now established what we call a carbon removals certificate framework, which will incentivize farmers and foresters to put in place practices whereby they can demonstrate that those new practices are reducing emissions effectively uh, by capturing carbon and, and storing it on a, on a permanent basis. Uh, and that's just one of the ways in which we're trying to bring that sector into the fold uh, of the sectors that are covered by emissions reductions, um, but in a way that uh, made sure that they can maintain uh, their, their, their livelihoods. Um, so let me just uh, wrap up by pointing again back to the Paris Agreement and to where I usually spend most of my time. Um, another part of the cycle that is, uh, we are anticipating um, for, for this year and the coming years is what we call the Enhanced Transparency Framework. So for the very first time, all parties to the Paris Agreement, 190 countries, not just developed countries, but developing countries as well, uh, including the EU and its member states, will have to report in their national inventories of greenhouse gases and the policies that they're putting in place in order to achieve their nationally determined contributions, the, the targets that they have um, pledged to the Paris Agreement. For us, it's our fit for 55. And we will have to see in that data evidence that those policies are being put in place, they're beginning to be put in, uh, uh, being implemented, and that the, the inventories of greenhouse gases are responding in, in a trajectory that's bringing us on a pathway to, to net zero. So the moment of accountability is going to be created at the Paris level as well as the European level, and I'm sure that, that Irish citizens will want to see as well that their governments are, are responding to this challenge. On the basis of that and the decisions that we, take, we took in Dubai, we will then have to, next year in Brazil, in Belém, come forward with our new targets. Um, and that's the, the 2040 communication proposal that Matthew mentioned where the Commission has recommended that in order for us to be true to what we've committed to under the European climate law and to respond to the science, that we would need to be on a pathway to net zero and that pathway for 2040 uh, would include, uh, from the Commission's point of view, a commitment to reduce uh, emissions EU-wide by 90% uh, from 1990 levels by, by 2040. From that, we will extract our 
nationally determined contribution for the Paris Agreement, and we're looking for support um, from, from Ireland and elsewhere to make sure that EU continues to show uh, leadership, and we can only do that on the basis of the leadership that we see uh, from member states like, like Ireland. Thank <laughs> you.